Welcome to Conference 2012. And wasn't that a fabulous welcome we just had from the Oklahoma Youth Symphony, conducted by John Clinton. And, you know, I don't know why this is, but every year as my hair gets grayer and I see young people playing in orchestras, it makes me feel really good. And I still like to hear old people play, but there's something really special about young people playing. And with all of the musical choices that young people have today, the fact that the repertoire that we perform is so alluring and compels them to the discipline and to the joys of working collaboratively in ensemble, to me is just a great, great feeling. And you know, as we know, no orchestra kind of comes together just by itself. They're like just too big. So you need, you need people to make it happen. And the people who are involved with our youth symphonies all over the country, the musicians, the parents, the staffs, the conductors, I like to just acknowledge them for what a magnificent role that they are playing in keeping our music alive and thriving. So please join me in thanking all of our youth workers. Now, this year's opening session is sponsored by DCM, one of our premier teleservices partners dedicated to supporting the sales and fundraising efforts of symphony orchestras. They're represented at this year's conference by President Phil Miller and Vice President of New Business and Marketing, Eric Nelson. And they're located at booth 810 in the exhibit hall. And Phil and Eric, I think you're here. I hope you're here, because I'm about to ask you to stand up so we can thank you. Are you guys here? There they are. Thanks, fellas. We'd also like to thank all of the League's conference sponsors and our exhibitors. You'll be hearing about and visiting with many of them throughout this week. Now, something very important. I want to thank all of you who have been supporters of the League, and I know there are many among us here who are in that group. And um, those of you who haven't, um, you'll notice those who have by some, some kind of appendage to their uh, their name tag. And what we like to see is no naked uh, name tags. We like to see name tags with lots of uh, pins and ribbons on them that indicate that you support the league too. And um, there's still time, believe it or not. And uh, we have an appreciation table in the exhibit hall and we'd encourage you to go there and to be part of the satisfaction of giving. Now, some of you are brand new and we wouldn't expect you to uh, consider a gift at this time. The Appreciation Center is open until Friday. So uh, <laughs> you got two days to make up your minds and see if you'd like to be part of the League family through this uh, very important way. And so thank all of you for uh, being here and being part of what makes the League possible. Now, we're also deeply, deeply grateful to the Dallas Symphony staff, their musicians, their board and volunteers who've partnered with us to bring you this conference. And a special thank you to Mark Melson, our conference liaison to the DSO staff, and to Heather Moore, who's organized the DSO volunteers for their extraordinary help. Thank you both. And now it is my pleasure to introduce the Dallas Symphony's board chair, Blaine Nelson. Thank you, thank you, Jesse. And I, I'm just here to wish you all a big, warm Texas welcome. Now, everything when it comes to Texas generally has something to do with warmth, uh, as, as, many, as many of you might have noticed uh, with the temperature. There's a, a little bit of trivia that I'll share with you. The, um, the, the word Texas, uh, Texas derives its name from a word Tejas, which many people have mistakenly believed is Spanish for Texas, but that's not true. It's actually, Tejas is, a, is an old Indian word, which actually means friendship. And in fact, the state motto, all states have, have their mottos. I think one of the more famous state mottos is New Hampshire, which is I think live free or die. But the state motto for Texas is friendship, which is really 
what its name um, is derived from, uh, um, an old Indian word which, which means friendship. So we like to believe that when you walk out and it's a warm day, it's a, maybe a hot day, um, that that's just the warmth emanating from everybody here in Texas <laughs> that is uh, happy to see you here. As you all know, Texas, Texas people, we, it's been rumored, you know, we're pretty proud of our state, and it's actually been rumored that we believe that if someone should actually be, have to be president of the United States, it's better if that be a Texan. But um, anyway, we want to welcome you here. This is the third time that the uh, League of American Orchestras has held their annual conference in Dallas, and, and we're extremely proud of that, and we're extremely uh, grateful that, uh, that, uh, that you've chosen to come and be a part of this important conference here in Dallas. The first time was in 1981, the second time was in 1994, and now in 2012. This is the 67th League Conference, and, and I think this is an extremely important uh, conference, and it's also an important time for us all to come together, as I understand the theme this year is all about coming together and working together on all the multiple and varied issues that are affecting our industry right now, and ultimately us charting a path forward that preserves not only the industry, but more importantly, preserves this great art form, preserves this music for the benefit of the souls who partake of it. After the, con we, there's a concert this evening, as you all um, have been invited to, and, and hopefully you'll be at, where the maestro of the Dallas Symphony and the, and the Dallas Symphony Orchestra will perform uh, at 8 o'clock this evening. You'll get a chance to uh, experience the, the great orchestra here in Dallas along with uh, the, the maestro, who uh, um, many of you know, received Musical America Award this past year for Conductor of the Year, and we're extraordinarily gr uh, proud of, uh, of that. Uh, immediately after the concert, there is a post-concert reception in the lobby and we would ask all of you to consider joining us and be a, being a part of, uh, of, uh, of meeting the maestro and, and, and others um, uh, that come out and join in that uh, reception. But welcome to Texas. We hope you enjoy your time here. We hope that your time is productive and fruitful and that a lot gets done. Thank you. I'm going to stay up here. Uh, Blaine mentioned uh, uh, a motto, and uh, I, I've got a motto to share with you, and some of you may, may have heard this before. To stop the flow of music would be like stopping of time itself, incredible and inconceivable. Aaron Copeland said that, and we're all here at the League 67th National Conference to ensure that the music never stops for any of our communities and to assure that there is a place for the music we love and for the musicians who bring that music to life throughout our country. We come to that purpose through very different roles. How many orchestra members do we have here today? Can I see by a standing up, a standing of up? Trustees, come on, let's see you. Welcome, and thank you for all the things that you do for your orchestras. And how about musicians and conductors? Are they playing hooky? Oh, there they are. Oh, I knew you were here. Thank you for all the great music you make. And what about our business partners? Let's have a big welcome and round of support for them. I hope you're here. Don't be shy. And what would we do without our volunteers? Let's see you stand so we can acknowledge you. And our orchestra staffs. Do they all stay home? <laughs> Now, some of you might not know this, but we actually have people who come here from very far away, even farther away from where most of you come from, from across the, the Pacific and across the Atlantic and as far as China and the UK. And I'd like to ask our international guests to 
uh, stand so we can welcome you. And uh, I understand we have graduate students here and others. So, <laughs> so if we have graduate students and others, let's also acknowledge you too. <laughs> so um, running through all these various categories, and you know, we, 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 we do this because uh, it really is who we are. I mean, we're not any one one constituent, we are a whole uh, that makes up the orchestra family, and that's how uh, we work at the League, and that's how we work at this conference. Um, but there's also another category of people here, and that is the actually 300 people who are coming to the conference for the very first time. And uh, I'd like to ask all of you to stand so we can recognize you. And before you do, let me just say that we are really counting on you not to sit back and see how it goes, but to engage from the beginning. That's how you'll get the most out of this. And your freshness, your first-timerness, will make you contribute much more to the benefit of the rest of us. So be engaged, say what's on your mind, ask your questions, and now stand up so we can welcome you. So at last year's conference, we flagged the threats, the challenge, the future of our orchestras. At this year's conference, we will continue to work hard at addressing them together. Civil and candid dialogue around tough issues, that's the work that's asked of every one of us this week. And I invite each of you to roll up your sleeves and make a commitment to keeping your minds and your hearts open. And to do this, we have to put the interests of our orchestras ahead of any single constituent interest. We have to move from our own points of resistance to considering new possibilities. And finally, we have to engage. You know, we can't hold back no matter how uncomfortable the comment or question may be. We've got to participate together. And we're going to be together in three general sessions. The one you're attending right now, Tomorrow morning's Driving Innovation, a Roadmap to Practical Implementation, and Friday's Call to Action. And to get us started, today's twin keynotes will be offered by Marty Malloy, Vice President of Labor Affairs at Ford Motor Company, and Jimmy Settles, Jr., Vice President of the United Auto Workers. So I imagine a lot of you are wondering, what does this have to do with us? Ford makes cars. We create the ephemeral experience of music. The auto industry over the past several decades has faced significant challenges that we think parallel some of our own conditions, like changing markets, increased competition, a volatile economy, and environmental changes that have required substantial adaptation. What is relevant to us is that management and labor at Ford built a relationship that allowed them to meet these external challenges. Today, Ford is thriving. It didn't happen through sheer luck, but rather through cultural change, long-term strategy that required a shared understanding and shared sacrifice, and holding to a higher ground course over a long period of time. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Marty Malloy and Jimmy Settles. Uh, thank you very much. That was a very warm welcome. Um, I got to tell you, it's humbling being here after listening to the young, these kids play. It was, that was awesome. Um, and it's, a, it's an honor. It's a great honor being here with Jimmy Settles. And what we're going to do is have a, a, a bit of a dialogue. This isn't a, a stiff speech. It's, we just want to talk to you a little bit about the relationship we have at Ford UAW and how we do business together. First of all, for, for those of you who might be unfamiliar with Ford Motor Company, we were founded in 1903. <laughs> Everyone knows Ford Motor Company. 
1903. We're about 110 years old. Uh, Henry Ford was uh, named by Time Magazine as the industrialist of the 20th century. We were organized by the UAW in 1941. That's actually four years prior the UAW organized both General Motors and Chrysler. And it was a reason why it took a little bit longer. Henry Ford was a terrific person. And he had a paternalistic view of, it, of his employees. He really tried, to do, really tried to do the right thing. But as time wore on in his career, it, we had some real, real difficulties in Ford. We had something called the Battle of the Overpass. And it was a, a really a violent exchange which really changed the DNA of Ford Motor Company and sitting back and asking the question, do we really treat our union brothers with respect? And in 41, the UAW was organized by Ford Motor Company, and I'm going to ask Jimmy to give his perspective of our history. Thanks, Marty. Likewise, let me thank the League of the American Orchestras for inviting us today. I must be honest with you, I never thought I had this opportunity or pleasure to speak about the orchestra. But thank you. Marty brought up about of the relationship with the UAW and Ford Motor Company, I think one of the clarifications that uh, I'd really like to give is when we were at Ford and uh, General Motors and Chrysler was, was organized in 1937, and I'm really I'm not the historian that Marty is, but I'm a fourth generation Ford Motor Company employee. Uh, my dad was hired right after the union um, um, wanting uh, recognition at Ford. It's funny, my dad got hired, then he got his dad hired. Uh, unfortunately, his dad didn't stay there long. Um, and then some years later, uh, I got hired there to work the summer uh, to go to college. And um, that was 44 years ago. Um, and I'm also really proud. I, I have a son that just started working for Ford Motor Company this year. Um, he's an engineer, he's on the opposite side, but he's still with Ford. So I say that to say this, some of the remarks, you're gonna say, how do you know what happened in 1937? Well, it was passed down and um, my dad also was a trade unionist. So it's probably the one thing that I did not want to do uh, growing up, I watched him and watched him how, how difficult that job was. But what we did often is talk about the history of Ford and the UAW. And I guess one of the most quite, the number one question I had, what took so long to organize at Ford uh, to, uh, for the UAW? And it was very obvious. Uh, Ford Motor Company back during that time was very active in the community. Uh, Ford, you, you go any place in the Detroit metro area, you'll see whether it's the arts or uh, sports or anything else around town. Ford was an integral part. As a matter of fact, Ford started the first housing project and they used to actually employ Blacks from, uh, blacks and immigrants, blacks from down south and immigrants from other countries that come in and they provided housing for. So I say that to, to, for reference, it was very difficult uh, to organize Ford because of what the Ford Motor Company did for them when they got hired. But you also have to realize the times, that was time between the great, right ending of the Great Depression and the beginning uh, of the World War II. So it was really, 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 very, very difficult to do that. And actually, the reason why we got organized, we got lucky. Um, there used to be a president that you may know about. He was not the only president of the UAW, but most people remember him and know anything about the UAW. His name is Walter P. Ruther. Walter P. Ruther, where I formerly worked at, they had a, a gate that took you from the parking lot uh, to the plants. And this particular plant is where I'm out of. It's the largest at that time, industrial plant in the world at the Fort Rouge. And they'd go up there and we'd pass out leaflets to get people to, to, to go for the union. Where this time, we had a real struck of luck. Harry Bennett came, uh, who was one of the Ford goons, and um, beat up the organizers, as we call them at that time. And just so happened, some photographers was there. And that really sparked the movement for us to get organized at Ford. I, I must, and I say it to say this because even as we speak today and as we go through our presentation, that there's always something different between the workers and the company at Ford. We always had some type of bond, bonding. Uh, even though we went through some very, very tough times, had some 
from 1941 to 1967 or 1976 was very difficult. We had many strikes, we had many disagreements, but uh, from 1976 on, we had to find a way to work, work through contracts without losing a day's work. I just want to say something also about when we talk about Ford, and one of the reasons why maybe it's not only I am proud to be a Ford member, but more proud to be a UAW member, is that I was a product of the 60s. And in the 60s, as you know, um, there were many demonstrations, whether for the war or for equality. And that's the reason why I really want to take that up, because at that particular time, I was in the midst of that. Uh, the union was in the forefront of it. And to be honest with you, there were many times when Ford Motor Company themselves gave us money in order to continue to change some of these inequities that were in the United States. Uh, so as we go on, you can see that there's been an ongoing relationship between the two. It's not something that we just thought about it was the right thing to do yesterday, and it happened uh, the day after that. And that takes us to this, this history and the journey we've been on with the UAW. It takes us to basically, I take it about 2006. We lost Ford Motor Company. You talked about in the introduction about cultural change, about facing reality. In 2006, we lost $16.5 billion. From the time of 2001 to 2008, Ford Motor Company lost $50 billion. I mean, no, there are very few companies in the world that can survive a $50 billion loss. At the time, our quality was not up to par. Our product development was not up to par. Our labor costs had increased to a point where it was very difficult to source product in the United States. We had a new CEO came aboard, a guy named Alan Mulally. I'm sure you've, many of you have read about Alan. And one of the things he did, he brought the team together. And he said, first of all, we're going to quit living in denial. And one of the things he said, it's amazing how people will reject data if it conflicts with their cherished beliefs. And I'm not talking just the hourly guy on the floor or the, the factory worker. I'm talking about the executives in world headquarters. We had to step back and take a look. There's a really good book on this, Good to Great. It's by Jim Collins. It was written about a decade ago. And he talked about the Stockdale paradox. And we talked about that with Alan Mulally and the senior leadership team. The Stockdale paradox is, by the way, Stockdale was the commanding officer in a Hanoi Hilton. He was a prisoner of war. And he talked about the people who lived and the people who died, the boys that came back and the boys that perished. The boys that died were the ones who were the most optimistic. They said, every Christmas we're going to get out. Or it's going to be Easter, they're going to let me out. It's summer, they're going to let me out. And they died of a broken heart. The other group that died was a group that had no hope. They fell into depression and just withered and died away. The Stockdale paradox is that no matter how bad it is, no matter how awful the data is, you face the data and you accept the reality. On the same time, you have a striving effort never to give up. And that was our calling card. And then we sat back, called up the UAW, and said, we're in a load of trouble, and this company is going to go bankrupt. Now, mind you, this was 2006. This isn't Lehman Brothers collapsing yet. This isn't the housing market collapsing yet. The odds on at Wall Street and in Detroit was that Ford Motor Company would go bankrupt in 2007 and we'd be no more. This great company, this icon of the United States would be no more. And that's when we sat down and we said, we got to do things differently. And that's when we sat down with the UAW. From that point on, we changed our relationship. First of all, we opened the books. There was no such thing as a closed book. There wasn't an issue or a, a member of senior management the UAW didn't have time to sit down and thoroughly understand the facts. And I've been on my job as the Vice President of Labor Affairs for Ford Motor Company for eight years. And if there's been one dramatic change, it's been the way we approach the union. It's not, I don't have time, or by the way, this stuff is awful complex. We open up the books, everything including probably the most cherished thing we have in the company and the most secret thing we have in the company is our cycle plan. 
And we share that cycle plan with the UAW because at the end of the day, we know they're our business partners. And the cycle plan is extremely secret for a variety of reasons. We don't want our competition to know the products we're coming out. And in the past, it was very secret because we didn't necessarily want the UAW to understand where we're going to source products in the future. It's a different way of thinking. It's a different way of sharing information. Jimmy? Yeah, uh, uh, let me uh, just take you back a little bit to uh, 1982, um, even though I'm, I know I look younger than Marty. <laughs> I'm many years his senior. But she, um, in 1980s, uh, the big three, or the, as we call it, General Mills and Chrysler, had dominated the market, uh, had better than 75% of the market. Uh, we were the only real game in town. Um, and the relationship that we had with the union and company worked well for both of us, I think. Uh, they kept things from us, and we tried to take them. Um, it was no different than what happened in the shop floor. Um, for headquarters, we put pressure on the plant manager. Plant manager put pressure on the superintendent. The superintendent put pressure on the, the general superintendent. And the general superintendent put pressure on the supervisor. And the supervisor put pressure on our, the union worker. And when we did, we fought back as best we could. As a union, we thought the best thing we could do is measure how much money we beat the company out of, how many grievances that we won, and then how, in many cases, how much hell we raised. Then came the 80s when we had competition uh, at Ford. At that time, there were well over 200,000 UAW and CA Canada workers at Ford. Today, we don't have 50,000. I came from a plant. I was president of a plant that was the largest, one of the largest plants in Ford. I must say we thought we was the most militant plant in Ford. And it was a new plant. And that plant closed. That plant closed after only being open 10 years. One, because of competition. And secondly, because I come out of a foundry, uh, some of the hardest, dirtiest, nasty work it is, that it, uh, they decided to move it out of the United States and have it done someplace else. But I say that to say this, at that time we had agreement that says a plant could close and they can hire, the plant next door could be hired. And those members didn't have an opportunity to hire. And that time Ford Motor Company and, and the UAW decided to sit down and open up the agreement. Said we had to do something, we had to change things because we had this competition going on. We really was not really focused on quality and I think even the company was, and they used to produce records, you know, and tell us, you don't buy a Ford if you produce on a Monday or Friday, because everybody was partying and they didn't care about the cars, and even came about, they passed a law called the Lemon Law, because no one was really keeping his eyes on quality. We were more focused on fighting one another than we were getting along. But in the 80s came and we decided that we needed to do something a little different. And little by little, since the 80s, we've been working together. At that time, that historic agreement was that we had a call we call preferential hiring, where they could be hiring in another, another state and give our, a person the opportunity to go to that state and work. And it was unprecedented. It's something for 40 years we tried to get and Ford resisted. The first time that I can say that they sat down and said, you know, we understand your union, that we need to work with you. We then at that time came up and we called employee involvement, for which they said to us, for the first time in history, we're going to listen to you. And we started to have these little circle meetings where workers were given their ideas, and workers at that point seen a lot of power and a lot of respect in the company. And I think that it goes to today, because since 1982 up until the present, that's what we have been doing. We have been negotiating contracts and being more open-minded. As Marty just said, just bringing us to the present. I never thought that I would be able to sit down, and, we, and I sit down with the top echelon of Ford Motor Company. It's not someone's assistant. I sit down with Malali, Fields, uh, Fleming, the top five. And, 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 and we also have quarterly financial meetings. We meet before the finances come out. We don't, they don't give us a, <laughs> the upper so we can buy no stock or nothing like that. Everything's legal. Um, <laughs> but we do meet. And seriously, it made us now think about how the company was ran. That we had decided now that we're not adversaries, that we are now partners. 
And then how do we partner better to make everybody happy? Obviously, Ford cares about profits. I think they care about people too. And obviously, we care about people, but we also care about profits. We just negotiated a historical agreement. Uh, we just decided that when Ford Motor Company prosper, we prosper. And it is such a simple formula that my granddaughter can figure out. For every X amount of money that Ford makes, then we get a profit share. And it's very transparent. Everybody sees it. And we continue this because it is a process. Is it absence of problems? No, it isn't. We have problems every day. We have arbitration cases. We have a case right now that we have a strong disagreement with the company. But that's what it is, a disagreement, that we have decided that we can agree to disagree and at the end of the day still may remain partners. Uh, we take it on the shop floor. We work in teams. We do all the necessary things we did, we needed to do, because we've seen a crisis and we've seen that that was an opportunity for us in that crisis. Opportunity so our members can have some real job security and they can know what they're doing from day to day and have an opportunity when at that particular location is not doing as well as other locations they need to hire to go. So Marty's absolutely right. Uh, this has been a very, very long process. I'm really proud to say now that, that we've seen the fruition of it. I think our membership sees it. But there's no way utopia. Yeah. And how we prepare, and I'm talking about the management team, we use a strategy called interest-based bargaining. I don't know if you've heard that term before. A guy named Bill Urey wrote a book. And we effectively cha uh, tra trained all the labor reps and all the senior managers. And if, if effectively, it's, instead of focusing on your position, this is my position, you sit down, I want this, you focus on your interest. And the other things that we talked about is be soft on people and hard on issues. I can tell you, sometimes we were hard on people and soft on issues. We go in there and beat the, the daylights, living daylights out of each other. <laughs> and we'd say, what the hell were we fighting about? And at the end of the day, we never got anything done. And the issue that was causing the problem was never addressed. The other thing we talk about is put yourself in the other guy's shoes. We constantly repeat that. Listen before you talk. Don't blame and show respect to, to your negotiators, to the respect of the people in the room. Let me give you an example of, of how this really made a major difference. In 07, before bargaining started, we decided to sit down with the UAW leadership and we showed them the Holy of Holies, our cycle plan. This was never done before. In the old days, we'd, we'd walk into the UAW, maybe five minutes before making a na major announcement, we'd say, here's where we're gonna build a plan. In 07, we said, no, we can't do that. We had two plants that build big SUVs. Those SUVs were transferred to other plants because there's hardly any demand for really large SUVs. We were going to close two more plants in the United States after we had already closed six, right on the trot. So we looked at it, and we said, based on today's economics, these plants are going to close. But here's what we're going to do. We're going to sit down with the UAW leadership, open the books, and say, is there something we can do to get our wages and the entire contract, including work practices and getting their opinion on areas which we never ask about, things like product development, and how can we structure a business equation that we can survive. We ended up at Louisville Assembly Plant. We have a product. It's coming off the line right now. It's a new escape. That was going to go to Mexico. That is going to be a three-shift operation. 4,000 people are going to be working in that plant. And for every one, for every one assembly job, there's 10 jobs associated with it. It's a multiplier effect of all the suppliers, everything in the community. We did the same thing with the Michigan assembly plant. We were going to close that plant. We're building the focus there. Before, we couldn't make money on a smaller car in the United States. Now we can make money on a smaller car in the United States is because we work with these guys. Okay? Three-shift operation. Another 350,000 vehicles coming out of the plant. Another 4,000 people. In this most recent negotiation with Jimmy, we were going to close another plant. It's AAI, Flat Rock plant, Flat Rock, Michigan. They built, they built a Mustang there. The original plan was take the Mustang out and move it somewhere else. One-shift plants don't make any sense in our business. 
sat down with the UAW, figured out a way to do it, and we're bringing the fusion. We're bringing a shift to the fusion. It's coming to AI. Plus, we got some other sourcing actions, which are good news, which we can't talk about because I can't make the headlines today. <laughs> That's Alan Mulally's. But that plant is going to be a three-shift operation. We'll build another 300 to 300 to 400,000 units in that. There's another 4,000 jobs. And we also did Ohio assembly plant. We're taking a medium truck built in Mexico, and we're bringing it into the United States. That's another 2,000 units. That plant was going to close. In this last agreement with Jimmy and the team, Ford Motor Company, in this contract we just signed, committed to the United States $16 billion of investment and 12,000 jobs for the United States. And that's working with the UAW. Jimmy? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. I must say this also. Um, what we did did not come without risk. Um, some of it that our membership was not very happy with is not the old style of bargaining, but we did it because we knew that was the right thing to do. I, I must say that when we did the last agreement, it started out to a very rocky start, um, that the first two or three plants that voted on the agreement voted it down. And uh, that's when I kind of took things kind of personal. And I said, <laughs> I better get out of here on the road and explain this myself, because I don't think people are explaining it correctly. And, and that's what it was. People are just afraid of change. And subsequent to that, I must say that we almost got a 70% approval at the end of the day once we explained what we were doing. Then also we had a risk, and then because of the transparency, I never forget, I, probably my first month or two months on the job, it was a, a, a product that was promised to Louisville Assembly. Ford came and said, look here, we want to, even though we have it in writing this part of the agreement, we want to do another agreement because we want to keep that car in Europe because it makes sense for us and we can make more money off of it in Europe, uh, but you're going to have to trust in us to say we'll bring another product here to replace it. Well, I tell you, that was really, really risky on my part. I had just been on the job a month. I asked him how come y'all didn't do that deal with my predecessor, but <laughs> uh, it wasn't to be, but that's what leaders are for. We decided to, uh, that's the road to go, and I must say that that came in fruition um, just this month, uh, sometime this year, rather, that product will be coming in Louisville. We talked to the leadership and the membership, and we explained to them the reason why we wanted to do that, and they agreed with us, and Ford upheld what they were going to say, what they did. And, and, and let me just tell you just the, little, the importance when we talk about bringing cars into the U.S. Well, it's, I think it need to be a brain science just to know that Ford Motor Company make more money off of trucks than they do cars. But what we find out is every time there's a downturn in the industry or the gas prices go up, people stop buying trucks and our people are laid off. And we decided we had to manufacture a car. And we worked very, very hard to make that happen. And that's what the two cars that we we're talking about, at least two cars that we we're talking about, bringing back to the United States. More jobs, more money, more taxes to be paid in the United States. So I am very, very, very elated about that. What Marty did also in our deliberations, one of the biggest problems that we had, and I don't know how to explain it because it's somewhat difficult, I don't know if it translates into the musical world, but we had to learn how to, our members, to work in teams. And our members really resented that because they hadn't been doing that for uh, inception. And so we just kept at it, and we was able to now break through and it makes us more productive, and it also obviously makes the company productive, and we lose no manpower because we signed an agreement and said, when we entertain this, that we would get new work if, in fact, we have efficiency changes that cause people to get moved from one area to another, which is really precedent setting. Our membership did not believe it would happen, but it has happened. And in terms of the negotiations which we take place, everyone thinks about the company and the union and the bargaining table. But there's other, two other negotiations taking place. I'll let Jimmy talk about union within union. I got to tell you, the toughest part of my job sometimes is negotiating within management. Because when I sit down with the union, I got to get everybody on board. That's the CEO of the company, Alan Mulally. The chief financial officer has to get on board. The operations manager, Mark Fields, Jimmy mentioned before. 
all the group vice presidents of product development, purchasing, manufacturing, everybody needs to be a part of the team. At Ford Motor Company, we consider negotiations a team sport. And we all have to be prepared. The other thing is, on opening day of negotiations, Jimmy and I talk so frequently, and Jimmy talks to the senior leadership of the company, guys like Mulally and you know, all the senior guys. There's no surprises on opening day. Jimmy's told me what to look out for. He told me, you better, get, you better think about this. Jimmy said, figure out jobs, Marty. If you can get the job stuff right, then I think we can get an agreement. By the way, it takes us three to four years on a cycle plan. So it takes three to four years to fix a job issue. So what we're doing right now, we're preparing for 2015. Because in order to respond to their demands for more jobs, we got to be on the ball right now. So you just don't prepare for negotiations like the week before. And there should be no surprises to the union or the company what the key issues are. It's an ongoing process, and it requires continual dialogue. Jimmy? Yes, let me uh, just also preface that the same thing on my side. Um, that you know, The number one motivator is always money. If you go ask to any of our members, what do you like to see in agreement? Money. I mean, number one, no problem. Um, it's money. And to change that mindset, because money is important, but we had to do a lot. I had to let people know that, do you remember just a few years ago, that person or persons that work with you is no longer there. And we had to come to the real realization that we could not negotiate ourselves out of a job. We wanted a fair and livable wage, that's for certain. But we wanted to make certain that we had some job security. And that was really a hard sell because workers are just like everybody else. Everything else is going up and their pay stay the same. So we had to take a lot of time. So I personally went to every building under the Ford banner and had an open conversation with the leadership and the membership and tried to convince them that one, that we need job security. And that was the most important thing. And we need to help and do our part to try to get America back to work. We went through, uh, I told you, I think I told you some numbers. We have lost, at the UAW, our membership used to be 1.5 million. And then up to 22 year, 20, 20 years ago, it was 1.2 million. Right now, we have less than 500,000. So that means almost a million families are now, that used to have good employment, no longer had that employment. And I told them, that we keep exercising the same mentality that we've been having, that we were crazy. That we had to change up something. We had to do something a little different to make certain that we had some employment for not only for ourselves, but hopefully for pe people in the future. And we need to do and make it attractive to do that. And we were able to do that. I tell you, it was some issue that I was really married to that we didn't get and one that our membership was married to, and that was cost of living. I mean, cost of living was an issue. I came to Marty and said, you know, we ain't leaving this table unless we get it. Uh, we didn't get cost of living, but just like negotiators do, we worked out a compromise, and we got, I think, actually, as we speak this coming Friday, our members will be getting a $1,500 check to help with them with the inflation. Uh, for the next four years. And it's difficult because I'm like anybody else. I get married to an issue because I think it's the right thing. I think that just is the right thing to do because we had cost of living. But you, and when you're a part of negotiation, you have to be flexible enough to understand both things. That we decided that it's much better for us to get into the product and make certain that we get a next generation of product then have three years of maybe temporary wealth, and all of a sudden, we no longer have a job. So uh, that was a very, very difficult task, but here again, working collectively together, and I think, as I speak today, that our membership, even though they voted 70% forward, and we had a vote today, we'll even vote higher than that, because it was the right thing to do. Yeah, we were running about out of time, but I'll, I'll leave you with, and I'll ask Jimmy, one last comment. I tell you, the enemy of collaboration and the enemy of working together is arrogance. It's the worst of all diseases. And the opposite is humility. 
It's the ability to accept the fact my view of the world is incomplete. I have been around Ford Motor Company. I've seen great plant managers. I've seen bad plant managers. Guys who've run product development, women who've been in finance, so on and so forth. The good ones, the great ones are humble. They listen to their people, they participate, and they collaborate to get things done. The worst are the people who think they're the Marlboro Man. Walking down that plant floor, kicking ass and taking names. And that's how we used to run the operation. And that's why we used to not succeed, okay? Now, the, the, the values and the behaviors we're looking for are people with some humility that will listen to others, including the union. Jimmy? I could uh, say ditto to that. I mean, I'm just very hopeful. I didn't know when we got here what value uh, we can give you, and, and particularly me. Uh, but I hope that we have done that. I say that because this is a recipe of success. Um, like I said, I've been around 44 years. I've seen it both ways, survived both ways. Um, I liked it when it was the other way. But when I had a plant closing in 1982 and I watched some of my brothers and sisters because they no longer had any job commit suicide. I watched how kids could not go to school because they had no longer had jobs. I said to myself then that we had to do something to change and if I ever got in position, I was gonna be that change maker. And I'm glad to say, because even though I'm at this end of it, I had brothers and sisters before me that did a whole lot more than before I got there. But I am really, really proud of the last agreement because if nothing else, we're preserving jobs and we're making America and better than it is. And those of you, I probably, I live in the city of Detroit. And I must say that I've seen the good times and the bad times. It's really bad times now, I look like a third world country. But just like everybody else, I have hope. We didn't have time to talk about some things. We engaged in getting employment in the city of Detroit. And we're trying to make certain those people are employed both before we employ them. So we're doing things to help society out. And that's what you do when you work together. We're able to do other things. We're sending a lot of orchestra band to London yeah, yeah. To, to play in the Olympics. We're doing all kinds of charitable things together because now that we can sit down and we understand that we have more interests than we have disagreements. So thank you very much for inviting us here today. Well, uh, you know, Jimmy ended uh, with a question, uh, or near the end of his remarks, you know, I, I, I wonder, I hope something I've said here has been of some value uh, to all of you. And um, uh, I think unquestionably, uh, if nothing else, the dialogue between these two men who have lived through uh, crisis and have come to find ways where each of them, each of their sides of the equation had to change and undergo and give up uh, different their patterns of behavior, their ways of working for a new way that resulted in mutual benefit for the company and for the employees. And I think we can only salute them for this commitment to uh, increasing employment in the United States and to having a long-term vision of what that takes and also to having a vision where a company is so successful that it can even get beyond its own uh, business and making that business healthy, but begin to contribute and give back to its community. So again, a hearty round of applause for Jimmy and Marty. And uh, you know, we're not finished with them. Uh, they're gonna be here tomorrow and there is a session uh, scheduled where there'll be an opportunity for a uh, panel uh, discussion to explore some of what we've heard today and also for participants in the audience to engage 
uh, with Marty and Jimmy and the rest of that panel in some of the questions that come, out, come up out of uh, this afternoon's talk. Um, if you are staying for the tour of the hall, please stay seated. The tour will start in just a few minutes with a short presentation by Mark Melson, uh, Artistic Operations Consultant with the DSO. And please remember that if you're coming to the concert and the tune-up party this evening, be sure to bring either your conference badge or your tune-up party ticket from your registration packets with you, as it will serve as your admission to the tune-up party. And finally, as you are leaving the hall, please enjoy the Allegro Assai Vivace from Organ Sonata No. 1 in F major by Felix Mendelssohn, played by the Dallas Symphony Orchestra's resident organist, Mary Preston, on the magnificent Lay Family Concert Organ. Thank you. Thank you.